Hello again, and congrats on making it to Friday, and welcome to Freaky Friday on the Podcast Daily. That is Berm, Bill Landis, I am Austin Ward, and we are going to open up the mailbag from ohiostate.rivals.com, because otherwise there's not a whole lot of news going on on the Ohio <laughs> State football beat right now, which is both a blessing and a curse, right, Berm? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly worse things that could be going on. You could have coaches getting fired or um, other things of that nature going on or, you know, moving all around the country. We're not expecting a lot of chaos, but, you know, never know when it comes. But at the same time, it is the end of January. And, uh, you know, while we have vehemently been anti mailbag for a while, like today felt like the right day to just open it up. Well, we did do it during out during the season it was just road break style so really bill we should have probably gone to grove city and card collector too and all just had some hobby boxes in front of us that probably would have been the right way to do it yeah this would have been a lot I've better had, if we were i've had seven beers for sure so i'm ready to go yeah seven hey, beers now you, yeah now you're so. talking now you're talking love that since it's 6 a.m on friday morning <laughs> that's right yeah. either way it's 6 a.m on friday morning <laughs> or middle of the day on thursday seven beers it's not okay <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Depends on where you are. It's five o'clock somewhere. That's true. That's true. Okay. So uh, we also will have uh, an interview later on in the show going back into the deep water with Ohio State swimming. This time it is the women's side, which uh, pulled off. I couldn't believe this stat, but apparently it was true that that was uh, the Buckeyes first ever dual meet win in Ann Arbor. Um, So three of those Buckeyes. Uh, will be joining us in the show. Aren't you yeah, concerned about getting a cease and desist from Mel Tucker for saying that we're going into the deep water? <laughs> uh, I don't I mean, know that's, if he actually that's, trademarked it. That's where they live. <laughs> that was one of the single dumbest things we saw all of last season was him plastering that on their student section. Yeah, it sure was. Weird. Yeah. Hey, can I ask you also... a mailbag question? Yeah, sure. definitely. Do you know how to swim? Yes. Yes. I'm always amazed when I like meet an adult that doesn't know how to swim, including like my best friend who I've known since I was in second grade. He's 34 years old, doesn't know how to swim. I don't know how that's possible. I thought that people our age uh, or younger all had to go through swimming in like gym class. I had to, and I lived in Wyoming. Oh, I we didn't did do not that. Have a, <laughs> we didn't have a pool in my <laughs> high school, buddy. I uh, hate to be the one to break it to you. Um, oh, yeah. We did. We, uh, ours was on the roof. Uh, only freshmen got to see it, though. <laughs> Uh, we did not have a pool. <laughs> we we uh we did not. That have sounds a like pool. a good story. Yeah, we we did not have a pool. Um, I learned to swim because I have ten brothers and sisters, and when I was younger, they just throw me into the water. So you know, <laughs> that's right. I had to figure it out. Hmm. I guess I didn't know I was living such a high class lifestyle with uh, a pool at Kelly Walsh High School. Yeah, that's definitely highfalutin. But, you know, the the bigger question is, did you learn how to like do like the backstroke and the 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 butterfly and did you learn all of them or did you just learn the basic, you know? No, swim? all you had to do all you had to do to get your passing grade was not drown. <laughs> you probably went to all- Safety City as a kid too, though, didn't you? What is Safety City? Oh, Bill knows. I don't cool. know what Safety City is. I don't know. I never went to Safety City either, but I'm sure people out there have heard of it. I've heard other people talk about it. It's like a place where you had to go and they like teach you how to deal with like, you know, the law and, and officers and like if you're in mm. trouble, if you get kidnapped, what you do, stuff like that. You never did that. My my dad was a cop every day with Safety City. Yeah, see. <laughs> my dad was a bailiff oh. and every day I don't was under- not Safety City for him. He, I'm trying to figure trying to figure out the connection or the implication that like I definitely went to safety city. I don't know. I what mean, is you're, that? you're a little younger and you had a swimming pool in your high school. I figured you probably had to do some other coddled stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's what people say a lot about growing up in Wyoming is how coddled everyone is. Yeah, well, I've, I've heard, I've got a totally different perspective of Wyoming now today when I find out that your high school had a swimming pool in it. Did you have a ice skating rink in there too? A squash, we sure did not. a swash court. I mean, the football field was covered in ice all winter. So yeah, I guess we had a massive one outside. Mm, neat. Mm. Yeah, we had a parking lot. Mm. Occ- occasionally, I guess occasionally there was ice on it. Congrats anyway. on the parking lot. That's big anyway, time. Anyway, anyway, this is I guess the rails early. This I guess we didn't actually early. need any <laughs> any mailbag <laughs> questions, but mm. the most recent one. Uh, it came Let's from AC start. the Tank yeah. Three. Yeah, 
I got it. He said, I've been meaning to ask, how tall are each of you? I can't tell if Bill <laughs> is a giant or Austin is 5'6 or both. Mm. I, I am not 5'6. I am 5'10. Yeah, I'm 6'6. Six, six, so yeah, I don't know. I'm like, I qualify as a giant. I'm like the normie. Um, in a, or six foot and a half, six foot one. So I'm the normal one here. Oh, so I thought you're still nor- above average. Yeah, yeah, I thought the nor- I thought the national average was like five nine. Yeah, but so I'm just really bare- short. <laughs> right. There are a lot of shorter people in the world, Burn. That's how you find an average. I know, but I also think that like if you go walk around when we are at Ohio State and we have our normal, you know, uh, media coverage. How many people do you think are five nine or shorter amongst the average men that are there? Probably ten percent. 15%? No, it's higher. It's higher than that. Higher than that. Really? Yeah. I can't see everyone. I'm just I'm looking straight ahead. I don't see them. <laughs> so I guess it's huh. different from Bill's van- Bill's vantage point. But yeah, Bill is really tall. Uh, I feel like I am a normal sized human uh, height wise. You know, <laughs> that's just the way I, that's the way I feel. <laughs> but I'm, I'm I'm glad we get to answer this for people. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, yeah. that's that's what they want to know. Um, okay. You personally get to play running back against Youngstown State week two next season. What <laughs> is your yards per carry? Berm. I think that people <laughs> underestimate how athletic even football players are in a FCS school like Youngstown State. So I'm going to say zero. Like I'm not. Yeah, zero yards I'm for, per carry. I, I, I'd be 45 years old by the time the season starts uh, or by the time, you know, a month away from that game. That's That's unlikely for me to get much. Uh, you know, depending on the upfront blocking, there's a lot of questions on this offensive line, folks. So I'm not gonna, I'm not just gonna dive in there and feel like I'm gonna step up to the plate and knock out a nice 1.2 at YPC. You know, <laughs> I, do, uh, I, do I have to run nothing but outside zone behind a new <laughs> offensive line? Because I, because I don't do, think that's gonna work. Do I? Have I've a seen fullback? Travion, I've seen Travion Henderson struggle to do that at Ohio State from time to time. So no, I don't want any part of that. You know, do I have a fullback? I mean, what are we what are we doing? Yeah, I trust Ohio State's offensive line to block Youngstown State, which will get me to the line of scrimmage. But I will go no further. It will be zero. <laughs> it will be zero yards per carry. I will fall on my face once I get near anybody. Yeah, a rough start here with just a breakdown of our heights and our <laughs> aging lack of athleticism for a for a actual on the field Ohio State football question. Wait, wait, wait. Thirty. What? You're not answering the question. Yeah. I said the same thing. I don't want any part of it. I I don't All right. I'm not going to get to the line of scrimmage. I'm going to turn okay. 40 next month. I'm quite overweight currently. Finally <laughs> like starting to get back into a gym. Uh but that's not going to help me. And like Mickey Marotti could have the next 8 months of working with me every single day and I'm still not going to gain any yardage against Youngstown State. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Uh, we're talking about my my knees are not going to allow me to move fast enough to get the yardage, even if my back, my balance, which is fairly good still at, at this age, <laughs> I I was I'm a fairly you know decent athlete, but my knees are just not going to get me there fast enough to get any yards. Yeah, that's I just think that's one of the positions that we're least qualified to play yeah. anywhere at any level. Like if you'd asked. If we thought we could complete passes against Youngtown, Youngstown State, I think I could do that. I don't think I could run for any yardage. Yeah, I could probably complete a ball or two. Depends on how far it is, yeah. But I think <laughs> I could do it. Well, we're gonna run. We're gonna run outside zone and bubble screens. So perfect. <laughs> I think we'll be okay. That little um, jet sweep okay. counts as a pass. I can do that. It's pull pop, pop pass. pass. Yeah. I'm going out there and calling nothing but pot passes, and then I'm letting the Mecca Buka run absolutely wild. That's right. Okay, Lou Buck 35 wants to know, now that Brian Hartline is officially the offensive coordinator, does Ryan Day stick with his, uh, quote, rumored plan? We have, uh, you know, reported more as a sidebar, specifically that that is Ryan Day's intention, but he has not publicly confirmed that. Anyway, back to the question, is plan to give up play calling duties? If he does, Ryan Day, does he still maintain a trump card to overrule a play call in real time, or does he fully embrace the CEO role of this team? Mm. Uh, Urban Meyer had other play callers for the, his entire time at Ohio State, and he trumped them a lot when he wanted to run QB power 
for example. <laughs> um, and Ryan Day will absolutely still have the trump card to call what he wants in a moment where he thinks that it's it. he needs to have his imprint on it. I do think it's one of the more interesting storylines around college football, though, this year to see exactly how much Ryan Day is willing to surrender to Brian Hartline and how quickly he reels that back in. We watched Jim Harbaugh do that in the 2019 season, 2020, where they tried, where Josh Gaddis came in in 2020 and he was like, I'm going to let them run the speed and space and do all. And then all of a sudden it was like, no, we're not doing that. We're running my offense. Um, it, it will be interesting to see if that changes. Now, that said, Brian Hartline is running Ryan Day's offense. It's not Jim Harbaugh trying to give up you know, entirety of, of the scheme. So it's not like it won't be something Hartline's familiar with, but Day also will have full veto power always. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I remember having conversations back in like 2015 and 2016 about sort of like the difference between like the, the voice who is just like uttering the play call and who's actually making the decision on which play is going to be run. Um, I, and I think there could be times where Ryan Day is, is certainly making that decision probably in the higher leverage moments. Um, I, I, I find it fascinating that he would turn over such an important responsibility to someone who's never done it before. And, you know, like every season's really important and crucial and critical at Ohio state, but this one feels um, even more so given the, the recent results against Michigan and the fact that people are starving to see this team win a national championship. And by the way, the schedule is pretty difficult compared to the last few years too. Um, it's not to say that Brian Hartline can't do it. Plenty of, of first time play callers f find success, um, but it is an interesting dynamic. And, and I do wonder um, you know, even on the road against Indiana, it's like when, if things get a little hairy in that game, how quickly does Ryan Day want to try to snatch it back and and bring it under his control because that's what he's comfortable with, and, and I think that's going to be something to monitor all year. I think if you're going to do it and you're going to hand it off to Brian Hartline, then you have to stick with that decision. Uh, and you guys have both alluded to that. How much, uh, how quickly would he want to try and grab control back? Like you run risk of several things, uh, but mainly upsetting. Uh, the dynamic, the relationship, the growth, the chemistry with Brian Hartline. If you start uh, shutting him down when you're you trusted him enough to do this, you're making this grand move and you're giving him that title. And ostensibly it is to help him develop and take the next step in his coaching career. And also to get some eyes uh, from potentially upstairs in the press box to look at what defenses are doing and maybe have a better feel for the play calling than, than Ohio State showed at times during the regular season last year. So I don't. If, if Ryan Day does it, I think he has to be fully committed to that. Is And the reason that when, when people asked us if they would consider hiring somebody from outside the program as a, a, a new blood to be the offensive coordinator, a new play caller, the reason that I don't think Ryan Day ever really considered that is because Brian Hartline has spent all this time learning Ryan Day's offense, being in those uh, you know brainstorming sessions during the week, knowing what's in all of those buckets of play calling that Ryan Day likes and the sort of things that he wants to use. And also, the other part is that they all work. So, <laughs> you know, you don't need to fully disrupt that. Um, we'll, we'll see how it transpires because there's still a lot of things about this that both Ryan Day and Brian Hartline are going to have to talk about publicly well before that they play a game. But, you know, I, I think that this move has been coming for a long time and, you have to be fully committed to it for it to work for both Ryan Day and for Brian Hartline. I don't know yeah. if Brian Hartline watches the podcast daily, but if he does, I would offer up a simple request. Brian, let's play a game of Madden. Let me see how you call plays <laughs> on Madden. And then I will feel like, hey, that's how things may go in the season. Is he a is he heavy run guy? Does he like to mix it up? Is he just going to air it out? We don't know. Well, the personnel would be different, Berm. You don't know what team he's going to have. Brian, what team would you use on Madden? <laughs> You're not allowed to use the Chiefs, so don't do it. Uh, anyone else is – oh, or the Bengals. Can't use the Bengals. That's my team. I think he'd use the Giants. He seems to like Brian Dable quite a bit. Interesting. Their, their wide receivers in New York are, are less good than I would – Or poo trash. Yeah, they sure are. Than, <laughs> him, than him looking for uh, at uh, his, 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 his position, so. That would be some really good uh, Freaky Friday content if you and Brian Hartline played Madden against each other. It's a great idea, actually. And I think that uh, America, listen, I need you to petition Brian Hartline on the Twitter and say, hey, Coach Hart, we want to see this. If you want to see it, of course. If you don't, you can just tell me to write off. <laughs> <laughs> Self-censored. I'm sorry. What? Sorry. What was that? Well, uh, I'll shut up for a second. 
Here's a question that is specifically for Berm. So for oh, all no. the recruit heads out there, how many kids end up uh, being from Ohio in the 2024 class? Uh, I am of the mindset that the Ohio State 2024 recruiting class is fairly large. Um, of course, I have been feeling that for the last few years, and then they keep getting smaller and smaller. I do worry that the NIL world means that the Buckeyes um, prep classes are going to be smaller and that they are going to try to stick around 20 a year and then supplement with the transfer portal. That's not anything I've heard. I'm just beginning to wonder if that's the right decision because how much money can you really allocate based on NIL and all that stuff if you're signing 28, 30 men classes. Uh, that said, I do have my iPad here, the trusty iPad. As I look at Ohio, I think you're talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Hmm, ten, I need a counting lesson. Hmm. I think nine. I think nine or ten. Well, I counted eight and nine are the De, 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 Deontay and Devontae Thompson uh, Armstrong. Sorry, at uh, Cleveland St. Edwards. So I just skipped. I just added two because they're the same. You know, they are, they are one. Um, I think you can see almost ten that's people. That's not from, how that from, works. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how it works. I'm a big biology guy. Uh, big things are happening in Ohio. It's the class is a much better than it has been in Ohio in the last uh, five or six years. But a nine or ten man class from Ohio would be the way for Ohio State to sort of mitigate the challenges of the NIL era. Because if you have that many guys locally, you think you could probably get by with doing less in the NIL space. But that does allow you to still spend some more uh, interest and, uh, I guess, you know, um, capital nationally if you're looking for that 25 or so man class. To me, that'd be the ideal. But you could see nine or ten for sure. It's going to be it's an interesting year. That plays in directly, Bill, into a question that we got several times, which is how we feel Ohio State is handling the NIL space. Um, I, probably not as bad as some of the public reaction out there would, would, would make you think. I, I do think they are somewhat significantly behind in the upfront stuff, which is the conversation we had with Gene Smith, where he basically said, yeah, we are. Um, I, and, I, and I don't know how aggressively they, they want to improve that that standing. Um, when it comes to like actual NIL deals, like endorsements for current players, I would I would imagine that Ohio State is as good, if not better than, than anybody. Um, but that's not really the game, or at least that's, I don't think that's the game that, that fans are concerned about. Um, they are they are wondering about how to get the, the best possible high school and, and, and transfer prospects to come here with those upfront deals. And and I think they're probably still better than, than a lot of places. Um but lagging behind probably the three or four programs that you would think Ohio State is competing with on an annual basis to win a national championship, and that is obviously a, a little bit of a problem. Um, and I, I wonder, like, I think we've had these conversations in, in the past, like how much of an eye-opening experience this most recent recruiting cycle was to maybe change those ways a little bit. But I'm still, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent convinced that even if they did want to change those ways, that that Ohio State at the moment is organized on that front quite enough to to make any kind of substantial changes. I I do think you have to almost chop it up into, I don't know, let's say thirds. Uh, in in terms of the upfront inducement, it's still better than most programs in the country. That's illegal. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. True. Great point. Sure thing. Um, however. If they are participating in this rule-breaking lawlessness, uh, I think they're doing it uh, in a fashion that is better than 90% of the programs in the country and certainly not as um, heavily invested as the other 10%, which is an interesting strategy, as we've talked about before, and we did in December at the start of the early signing period. It hasn't really proven itself to work for someone like Texas A&M or Miami or Michigan State, just for three random examples off the top of my head. Um, is it going to have to change when you go head-to-head -head against Georgia and Alabama, uh, Clemson, Tennessee now maybe? I, possibly. Maybe not. I, I, I could be proven wrong on this. I think that Ohio State has carved out a lane. I've said this to you guys many times before that I think is sustainable for them, which is, why, which is because of the second slice of the pie, which is how much – their current athletes are making in the NIL space, how much their endorsement deals are, uh, how many opportunities they have to make money around Columbus uh, and from the, the school itself. They're making a very significant chunk of change, and I think that that showed itself 
most recently with Josh Proctor's decision not to go gamble uh, at to leave at the next uh, when he could have tested well and try and gone to start making a paycheck. And he's not the highest profile example. Like when you have Tommy Eichenberg, Kate Stover, Lathan Ransom, these guys are all getting larger financial packages to stick around. I've had several people involved in college football around the country tell me that they think Ohio State is the top earner for their current roster in the country. Um, so they are getting it once they arrive. That is the part that Ohio State, I think, can lean into and have the most success with. And then the third phase of that, cohesion, I, I know, is trying to be more publicly facing and working to do uh, PR and bring more awareness to that. I've had conversations with them this week about that, uh, and we'll see if that makes an impact moving forward. Um, but they have not, the, the three main collectives have not been very successful in their PR strategy. One, because cohesion didn't have one. Two, because the the foundations is an absolute embarrassment and a joke. And the third one that they mentioned for basketball, I'd never even heard of until Gene put out that statement. So that part has not been good. See, I actually have con- questions and concerns about the long-term, the continuity of, of how much you can pay your current players because eventually, if the team doesn't do a better job in bringing in really good players in the recruiting world, eventually the team starts losing more games and then people want to pay less money to the athletes. So I, I think all these things have to tie in together. Um, we've talked ad nauseum about this. It's it's Gene Smith and the athletic department being willing to reach out to the primary, the biggest boosters and say, we need you to allocate your investment in the school this year into NIL. Uh, It's also a a matter of the coaching staff, which we know from talking to them is extremely aggressive, trying to convince Gene Smith and the administration that this has to happen. But until that occurs, I just don't think that is going to make a difference. And, you know, we're talking right now that they're better than 90% of the country, but that number is going to continue to shrink as you see programs like Florida state who be very aggressive, Auburn be very aggressive now, um, Texas, Texas Tech, Texas A&M, um, Houston starting to ramp it up, Louisville, Michigan State, uh, USC, Washington, Oregon. Like it, It's starting to become an issue where if you're not willing to compete uh, in that space, you're going to have a tough time getting players into the program that local businesses are excited about. But we, I mean, we could talk about this forever. Uh, it, it's never going to matter if, if the mindset at Ohio State doesn't change in the administration. I have a question about that, Berm, that I'm curious your opinion on. Um, and you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I feel like Ohio State to this point has been reticent to open the door up back to players that maybe they missed out on the first time around because of NIL reasons. Do you think they need to adjust that philosophy? Because as to Austin's point, like, there's not a whole lot of proof of concept, and there are a lot of guys who are leaving places unhappy with the, the deals that they were supposed to get. Um, does a place like Ohio State that might not be able to uh, accommodate that on the front end need to be more willing to maybe rekindle those relationships the second time around when those guys do go back into the portal? I don't know. I mean, it's something we've talked about for the last year. If a kid's primary motivating factor in his initial decision is money, Ohio State does not generally believe that player is going to fit the culture that they have in Columbus anyway. So I don't think that you'd see them coming back and and being different second time around. Now, Mm. if you're talking about, I'm just going to pick a random player, for example, let's say Caleb Downs down at Alabama, right? That's a player who obviously NIL becomes a part of the conversation towards the end when it's a a back and forth to Ohio State and Alabama. Alabama is going to have a little bit more to invest in a little bit more capital. But the reason he picked Alabama primarily was development and the opportunity to play in the NFL and the national championships and that kind of stuff. So if a player like that reopens his his mind a year from now, it's probably different than a guy who picked, you know, Michigan State or, or Miami yeah. over Ohio State. So it's really on a case by case basis. I don't think it's something that you can just um you know, big picture it and say, well, in general, they're, if if the if the factor that they picked a school for was money, that's not going to change whether or not Ryan Day thinks they're a fit in the program. And that's ultimately what every transfer decision comes down to. Okay. Uh, we have a question from D.B. Malone. D. Bone Malone, excuse me. Oh, Make boy. sure I get that right. Who are some of your favorite Ohio State players to interview, past or present? Hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. There are oh, there are a mm. lot. Um, they're almost really, always offensive linemen, right, Bill? I mean, the offensive <laughs> yeah, linemen are the, yeah, they are. I find them to be maybe the. I don't know why that's the case. Maybe because they don't they they get the least amount of attention. So whenever it is given to them, they're they're really excited about it and and <laughs> uh, seem to seem to enjoy that that part of it. Um, I, I really like they're, to, they're, they're the most cerebral people on the football team, and I think yeah, maybe just, yeah, are, that's are the, that's probably true as well. Um, I think my all time favorite guy to talk to in the time I've been covering Ohio State is Taylor Decker. Um, just like a really thoughtful guy, really sharp. Also didn't really take BS either. Like if you asked him a dumb question, he would tell you, you asked him a dumb question and then dismiss <laughs> it, which I always appreciate. Um, but when you asked a good question, he gave you a really thoughtful answer. Um, and I felt like every time we talked to him, I like learned more about football and sort of what, what makes these guys tick. So, um, and there have been others like that, but, but he's sort of been my stock answer for the last few years. Mm. Pat Elfline is great. Um, Jonathan Cooper, fantastic. It's just a really great person to talk to. And Coop would always be honest, but he'd always be energetic. And he would always, you know, be a, he'd do his best to, like, make you feel like you're enjoying the conversation. Mm -hmm. You could tell, even if he wasn't feeling it, he wouldn't be a jerk about things. Same with, like, Jordan Fuller, guys like that. Like, they knew how to, to be a professional in that setting every single time, no matter what the circumstance. I mean, there's a, a laundry list of guys we could go down, but that, those are a couple to me that stand out that maybe don't get – talked about enough or you know we i could there's obviously other names we can throw in there awesome yeah, i thought we were gonna Arnett. i did love talking to damon arnett and there was that one bizarre season like 2018 right where the corners decided that they weren't going to speak to anybody <laughs> and kendall sheffield really was the driving force behind that and then you know uh jeff akuda and and uh, Damon Arnett sort of had to fall in line, and I don't. I don't think we talked to them all year. I think it was 2018. Uh, it must have been right because then Akuda yeah. and, and Damon yeah. went. They the next year they were like, ah, I don't know why we didn't talk to you all last year. We're back now, and <laughs> Damon like had a lot, bunch of thoughtful things to say about uh, what went wrong for him and how much better he was going to be. And obviously, it takes on a little bit different uh, perspective now. Um, given some of his issues off the field. And I, I hope that I hope that things are trending in the right direction for him because I always greatly enjoyed my interactions with him. He was absolutely one of my favorite players to cover when he was at Ohio State. I don't know what happened uh, after he got a little bit of money in a first round draft pick and, and went out to Vegas. That's not the Damon I know. But then again, like we don't get to spend uh, hours of, of upon hours with these guys off the field. Um, sometimes we get lucky and have some relationships like that where we are able to become a little bit more friendly and, and communicate with them through some of their life struggles that have nothing to do with football. That doesn't happen very often. Um, I would say uh, amongst the recent guys who have now struck it really big, I appreciate the fact that someone like Terry McLaurin, Sam Hubbard, uh, they haven't forgotten us when they leave and they, they, they can, I don't care if they do. I don't, <laughs> doesn't hurt my feelings when you become an NFL star and uh, go live your own life. But the fact that those ones that have made it big and still uh, will take the time to text or uh, respond. If you send them a congratulatory text as Berm did to Sam uh, after the 98 yard fumble return, <laughs> um, that carries a, a lot of weight. Berm, what did you say to Sam again? Uh, nothing. I just sent him a kissy face emoji. <laughs> I had a few pops. Um, no, but, you know, there's also guys, I think it's interesting when you talk about the way that th the life of, of these players changes from the time they get to Ohio State as a freshman to the time they leave after a fifth year like JT Barrett. JT was a, a totally different interview early in his <laughs> career than he was at the end of his career because he got so sick and tired of being asked the same things by the same people who just kept telling him that he stunk basically over and over. And he, like, meanwhile, he's breaking every record at Ohio state and people keep, keep being doubted. And you could tell like by the end of his career, when the lights were on and the cameras were on, he was just tired of it. Um, and now when you talk to JT and you run it, he's back to his normal self and it, it's, it's good you know, JT again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of um, interesting just to watch how that all transpires. I mean, there are guys who at the beginning of their career, like KJ Hill, for example, beginning of his career, wasn't very, uh, loquacious and by the end of his career kj was a, a great conversation so it's really just about 
I think the setting that you're in, if, if we're in a full, you know, media harangue and there's 35 people standing around, it's a little different than if you got one or two people that are doing the conversation, like people like Chase Young, for example, Chase in private conversation is extremely like talkative <laughs> and, and very uh, upfront and honest. But in, when you're dealing with him in the larger setting, he turns into a little bit of coach speak and uh, it changes the, the experience. Juno. Yeah. Juno. In his defense though, and everyone else's defense, who wants to talk to 35 people at the same like, time? Ask, like oh, Joey Bosa, for, question. for example, Joey Bosa is one of the funniest people like in, in the, 12 years that I've covered Ohio State, I think Joey Bosa may be like the most naturally funny person that we've gotten to cover. He just has such really great dry humor, but I don't think everyone would get it all the time. So it, it he was always fun to talk to because if you just listen, he, you knew he was going to say something, some smart ass thing that was just like <laughs> totally off the wall. But I don't know, there's a lot of good dudes. Who do you think is going to be the best spokesman for Ohio State in 2023? Mm. Donovan Jackson. Mm, future president maybe he's good yeah but in his presidential way he's good at uh like not saying a whole lot like he's he's polite and and will answer your questions but i think he keeps it pretty close to the vest you know who really has improved is marvin harrison the marvin harrison at the start yeah. of last season to the end of the season was a totally different interview experience and i think that's just a, a really good sign for ohio state as he continues to grow into that more of a, a vocal leader like i think that's a guy who We'll talk to a lot, and I think he's getting much more comfortable with it. And even to the point where with Peach Bowl Media Day, like he actually started to get a little bit like, I deserve this. I should have been here. Like that. It's a cool, it's, I, I just enjoy watching these people transform from being wallflowers to being, you know, the type A personalities that everyone who goes to Ohio State really is underneath everything. It's kind of a weird one to answer, right? Because Cade has no interest in, uh, attention tommy has no interest in saying even a full sentence to the media <laughs> uh steel has become very good and very entertaining but he also doesn't really want to talk about football in those settings he'd like to weigh in on virtually anything else uh, i don't you know donovan jackson's probably not going to be in the spotlight a great amount um i think josh fryer is pretty uh entertaining the few opportunities i've had to get to know him but that'll be a new experience for him going out on a weekly or semi-weekly basis to talk as a as a starter, likely at right tackle. Um, one of the guys I think who's in the midst of a JT Barrett regression into a, a shell, which is really unfortunate, is Travion because uh, he's a fascinating dude and also doesn't have a great filter, but he's been burned by that several times. He had the, the concussion thing that uh, other members, members of the media kind of flipped on him and made it out to be a much worse situation. And uh, kind of bothered him early in the year. And so I don't know if we'll see that version of him anymore. Plus, you know, he's come in for a fair amount of criticism for the way he played um, while going through injury. So it's hard. I, I don't really have a great feel for who who's going to be a number one that to, you have to go talk to to get quotes next year. I mean, there are guys like Emeka Abuka. Emeka is always great. He He's a kid mm -hmm. that is extremely um, well-spoken and smart and but he's willing to talk about the game and I think he's probably one of those guys we'll, we'll look back on in a few years and go man that was a really great interview just to talk to um, but I also think that we'll get a sense for that really in the next few weeks as we start to get back into you know seeing the guys on campus and I'm fascinated to see how Kyle McCord as what we talked about on Wednesday's episode of the podcast daily like how does Kyle step up and, and become the the voice of the team, because if he's going to be the, the, the starting quarterback, that's something he's going to have to embrace. He's yeah. never struck me as timid. Like the, the few times we've talked to him, I think, I think he would kind of wear that well, if, if that's the role that he's in. And I expect he will be at least in the spring. Um, I think Jack Sawyer too is a guy who holds not afraid to speak his mind. So maybe, maybe he can fill those shoes. Yeah. Jack probably says too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say less. Uh, well, yeah, hopefully we get to that point soon because spring ball is a, a fun, informative time, uh, and we'll love to be doing those interviews more in person. Getting out of this dry spell would be great, uh, but it's late January. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, what do you guys expect on Conference Championship Sunday? Are we going to get an, an eagles Bengals showdown in the Super Bowl? My wallet hopes so. <laughs> it, it is really hard to beat a team four times in 12 months, um, and that's obviously what Ohio State or Cincinnati, Ohio State, whatever, 
what the Bengals are trying to, to accomplish here. The Cincinnati they, Buckeyes. It'd be four times in 13 months to beat Pat Mahomes is not easy to do. Uh, Lou Anna Rumo, the defensive coordinator for the Bengals, is a freaking genius. So you don't know. He, he's had a different defense against the Chiefs the first three times. We'll see if he can put a, a, a different spin on it again. Um, certainly the Bengals offensive line, which played really, really well against Buffalo, probably is not going to have the field conditions that are the same in Kansas City. And so I think the, the snow actually helped the Bengals offensive line because Buffalo wasn't able to, to rush quite as aggressively as they would have normally. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue for Chris Jones and the Chiefs, but I also watched Joe Burrow get sacked 10 times last year in the playoffs against the Titans and still win. So um, Joe Burrow is the quarterback for the Cincinnati Bengals, correct? That is, that is correct. correct. And the Bengals will win on Sunday. That's really good. Mm. I think, I think okay. the Bengals will win. Um, my heart tells me the Eagles will win. Nick Bosa terrifies me. Um, and uh, I think that is going to be an absolute battle, the Eagles offense going up against the 49ers defense that I am very excited to watch. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of conflicted. Uh, if I assume the Bengals win, which I certainly am not doing. I mean, I, I'm a Bengals fan, for God's sakes. I know how these things go. Uh, but I part of me, my heart says I want the birds to win for Bill. Uh, my brain and, and 35 years of animosity uh, towards the San Francisco 49ers uh, makes me want to play the 49ers in the Super Bowl. If the Bengals get there, like I wanted the Bengals to play them last year in the Super Bowl because they would have really beat them last year. Uh, but, you know, whatever way it goes out, it, it's going to be fine. I just don't want the Bengals to lose in the Super Bowl on the last minute touchdown because <laughs> that happens too much. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't take it again. Can't okay. Take it. We got Berm into tears. That was the goal of a Freaky Friday mailbag. Uh, now we're going to uh, look elsewhere on campus. We're going to talk to Ohio State women swimming and diving. Uh, and then we'll call it a wrap on the podcast daily for this week. And we'll be back again on Monday for Berm and Bill. Uh, they're out of here. I'm about to jump into an interview. And then we'll see you all again uh, next Monday. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. It's that time again. It is a Freaky Friday special. It is time to look uh, elsewhere on campus at Ohio State. And there was yet another huge win and a program uh, making some waves. We're diving back into the pool with Ohio State women's swimming and diving. Previewed that trip up to Ann Arbor last week with the men. And guess what? The women got a big win up there as well. The first victory for Ohio State ever in Ann Arbor. I could not quite believe that stat was true, uh, but these Buckeyes played uh, a huge part in that. We have Felicia Pasadine, Teresa Ivan, and Lena Hinchel joining us on the podcast daily for a Freaky Friday. Uh, what was the celebration like for these Buckeyes? Uh, first, I mean, did you guys know that that was the stakes going in, that there had never been a win in Ann Arbor? Uh I mean, Lena, that's that's some uh, that's some major history that's made for the program. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, and I'm really proud um, of the whole team, how we um, fight through the weekend. Um, I didn't know that this would be the first win for us. Um, I'm not that familiar with the whole history <laughs> because I'm ju I just arrived in August and I'm um, a freshman, so new in um, in the team. But um, when I saw that we like we wrote history. Um, I was even more proud of the whole team and it was a really good competition. Um, we, we f fight it through the end and yeah, at the end of the day, we left, um, Michigan with a huge, um, success. So Teresa, it doesn't seem like maybe the rivalries <laughs> and swimming programs are quite to the same of maybe, you know, the football when Ohio state and Michigan tangle, but <laughs> it had to, it had to count for something for you all. Like, how gratifying was that win? Um, I mean, so we won last year, and that was a home win. And that, being a freshman and, like, experiencing that, that was incredible. Like, for the first time ever doing that. And then just being able to back that up, like, was absolutely incredible. We had a meet the previous week, so we all went into that pretty tired and <laughs> exhausted. But like Lena said, we fight like we fought till the end. And um yeah, it was just incredible to back that up again this year. Alicia, so you came in as a grad transfer transfer from Harvard, right? Yes. But you have some knowledge of what Ohio State Michigan means growing up around here, right? So mm -hmm. uh d does that rivalry transfer over to the pool or or not? Just 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think just growing up in the Cleveland, Ohio area, I was always an Ohio sports team fan. So I was always a fan of whoever was playing against Michigan, right? I never ever <laughs> wanted Michigan to win. Um, so the same honestly translated over here. I mean, I think back then, like, or in, in undergrad, the big rivalry was like Harvard versus Yale. And we'd get really hyped for that. But I think the Ohio State Michigan rivalry is um even hits hard, like hits home even more because um it's part of my roots. So yeah, it was a huge deal for us to win. And I left ecstatic. And I think it only produces more momentum uh for what we want to do at the end of the season. So it was such an exciting day. Yeah, it, it seems like Felicia that like this is such an individual sport, but you're you're counting points as a team. So like Every week, you probably you're trying to set PRs and reach your goals, and it it maybe doesn't matter who you're diving against or who you're swimming against or what colors they're wearing. But you know I, that sort of camaraderie from a team, how does that really show up for a a swim roster? Yeah, I mean, I think oftentimes swimming or diving are are labeled as individual sports, but in all reality, the way we train and then the way it translates to to meets doesn't actually feel that way. Um, like how we race our training partners in a friendly, motivating, competitive way every day at practice translates directly over to the meet. And we're really almost helping each other through the race. So if I'm in the middle of like a difficult 400 I am, and I know that some of my other zone mates, um, as we're separated into zones based on the way we train, uh, are in it with me, it feels like very team oriented. And then same goes for relays, right? Like I try to do well, not just for my relay split, but because I don't want to let my other relay members down. Um, and relays are huge points in terms of trying to go for a win. So ultimately I think, um, that that's a really big deal for OSU. We have so much depth that it, it really does feel like a, a team effort. 100%. Lena, uh, sort of along those lines for you, when you come over, you know, from Germany and a lot of new things to be around and a lot of new teammates and there's so much probably that's new for you. What, what's the. What's the toughest part of the transition or, or how much does it help to have uh, a, a stable group of, of teammates uh, and Buckeyes around you to help make that maybe a little bit easier? Um, yeah, so the, the change was really um, what you was huge and um, the step to the States um, was not um, that easy for me. Um, it was a difficult decision because I was actually, I was, I was happy back home, but the combination of... Um, academic education and continuing my um, diving career is um, so much better here to, to realize than it is back home. And I came here and suddenly from one day of the other, I was a, a member of a huge team and I never experienced this to be in such a huge team and win and lose as a team. I was always... Um, by myself on the diving board and I, I, I always lost or won by myself and um yeah that was a, a nice experience and I really um I love my teammates um as well the swimmers and the divers uh we are like Felicia said that uh, we are fighting through every competition together and um yeah it's it's incredible how this team is working together and how we push each other through difficult times and there's always someone next to you or around you um, who is there for you, who can help you. And yeah, I, I love this team spirit here at Ohio State. So last week, you know, on the men's side, they were talking about how they, they all travel in packs when you, when you are away from the water and all the things that they like to do together. Teresa, what does this team like to do uh, when you don't have to train, when you don't have to compete uh, at the pool? So most of us, we're always doing something like we're always together. Um, dorm kids, like we hang out in the common area, which is where I am right now. Um, and we'll just like do homework. Um, I'm not sure what off campus kids do, but <laughs> we'll do like zone dinners. Like, like, like Felicia said, like we train in zones and we'll go out with those girls um, to dinner or we'll do like gender dinners. We'll do dinners at the coach's house. Like we're always, always together. Um, and it's just great, like getting to connect outside of the pool and do all that stuff. Okay. And you said that there's a, a little bit of time off coming or two weeks after this trip to Notre Dame. Or, does everybody need a, a little bit of a break before the final stretch or or do you want to keep some of this momentum going? Um, We're going to keep the momentum going, but it's nice to just have a week where we don't race. So like we'll still be training, doing like what we normally do, but it'll be nice not having to like, travel elsewhere and like kind of expel that energy 
towards like swimming and we can kind of give our bodies a rest before we head into championship season, which is very soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I know a lot of people will be uh, paying attention to that, especially after the big win last weekend. So uh, before you all go, what we like to do on Freaky Friday is we look around all around campus and with name, image, and likeness now being a thing that everyone, well, maybe not everyone, I did learn that there are some international restrictions. So I don't know if they apply to two of you in this situation, but just pretend like you're allowed to go get whatever NIL deal you want. Anywhere you want to eat, anything you like to wear, it can be anything that comes to mind. Felicia, if you got to to pick your ideal NIL deal, you're going first, so the pressure's on you. Uh, what would you want? Yeah, uh, I think I'd, I'd have to go with the, a big brand here that I'm a, a believer in. I'm going to have to go with Google. I think Google <laughs> has just, just provided so many jobs, and they really like just transformed and, and revolutionized what the internet means to us, um, increased uh, access to educational resources. And if there is some way I could partner with them and, um, you know, be compensated for brainstorming ways to like help young adults learn about more about healthcare or um, yeah, accessibility to other resources they don't have access to. Uh, I think that would be amazing. So I'd say Google. You have shot higher than anybody else <laughs> on any episode of Freaky Friday. Um, pretty remarkable. Okay. That's good stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, Teresa, where would you go? Um, growing up in the South, I would try to honestly to get something with Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. <laughs> like that is like my go-to. If I need something, it's Chick-fil-A. So if I can get free food or anything, okay, I got to go for that. I got to go for that. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll make sure that they get tagged uh, when we drop this episode and we've got one more spot. What do we got? Lena? Um, <laughs> I honestly have never thought about this, but, um, I think I would go with Starbucks, to be honest, uh, Ooh, because, okay. uh, yeah, um, one or two coffees a day um, are mandatory. So, yeah, <laughs> I think I would go for Starbucks. All right. I love it. it all of those are, are great options. You can't go wrong. Like it's, it's you got to it's got to be something that you believe in. Uh, and clearly, uh, those would be good fits for you three Buckeyes who are achieving at a really high level. Big win last week in Ann Arbor and looking for uh, some success on the road at Notre Dame this week for a meet. Uh, thank you all for your time and we wish you all the best of luck uh, for the rest of the season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. For those three Buckeyes, I'm Austin Ward. This has been Freaky Friday on the podcast daily.